Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 377, the Nor'easter edition. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it's Thursday, the 8th of March, 2018. Okay, a lot of you don't watch the Weather Channel as much as you should, and here in America we watch the Weather Channel. We found out the Northeast, which is where I live, it's kind of all the way from uh, Maine all the way down to New Jersey and sometimes uh, further south was hit with the nor'easter that's where the the storm goes in uh, counterclockwise fashion and just brings rain in the winter snow off the coast and lands it here uh, uh, on the east coast of America and uh, I'm looking out there about a foot of snow freshly fallen uh, white stuff on top of my cars uh, but it's not just happening here. Snow is happening everywhere. You guys had a lot this winter in England. We really did. And we've just had another week of it. And it's caused chaos everywhere. And the, the Norwegians have been laughing at us. But worse of all, the Canadians have been laughing at oh, us, no. which we find very <laughs> difficult um, because we handled it so badly. And uh, the infrastructure for the water companies means that we have burst pipes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the delights to me is, is that... Um, uh, I started um, putting out large quantities of fat balls for small birds. We live up in a hill just part by a wood, and uh, we have about two dozen small uh, wrens and tits and blackbirds and robins who feed on the patio outside the window. And uh, um, it's just been a complete delight, A, to make sure they're kept alive. <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, and uh, to, to see that both them and us through the snow. So this this company of, of hungry birds has, has given us huge delight as this blanket of snows sat on our hill. Well, a lot of people don't know this, but you have not been recording your AU from the chapel. No, no, I no, I haven't. The, the, a, a, the, the, the chapel is, is cold. extremely cold. <laughs> And and B, um, I I've, I'm taking some while to recover from the surgery of this yeah. of this eye, and uh, I won't bother you with the details. But it's taking longer than I hoped. Well, we'll keep it in our prayers. Uh, definitely keep Gavin your prayers for your eye. Although you know you really that eye patch is looking cool. You know, <laughs> it, for anybody in ministry, you show up in an eye patch. <laughs> what you need is a nice tattoo right here. And uh, I, I think, you know, this bishop thing will really start taking off with you. There are not many uh, one-eyed bishops. <laughs> I, I saw a, a, a war movie the other day. And yeah. there was this uh, SS officer wearing an eye patch. And to impress the woman he was with, he leapt up and, and jumped onto a football field and juggled the football and kicked it a bit and ran back. And I thought, there's no way you can do that with one eye. <laughs> It's he fell flat on his face, <laughs> but uh, there we are. It's made me yeah. hypocritical. Well, the the death uh, perception is gone. Uh, totally. You know, yeah. especially in the, I mean, over time your brain will overcome it, but uh, to a certain degree. But you, your first year, uh, everything you reach for, uh, it's just not there. Got my coffee. Oh, absolutely. And I have two yes. eyes. <laughs> I, I reach for everything like this. <laughs> it's, true. it's true. It's getting it's getting better, thank God. And and thank you for people who've been praying for me and writing me encouraging emails. I'm very grateful. We'll 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 get there. Okay. This is the second time we're recording today's episode because we have a difficult topic. Um, it's sexual abuse within the church. It's trying to uh, discover sexual abuse within the church trying to fix past wrongs and avoid future wrongs. Um, it's one of the greatest stains in the history of, uh, of the church globally. Um, there's no denomination left out of this. Uh, the Roman Catholics have had to deal with it, the Methodists, the Lutherans, the Anglicans, and uh, it's a hard topic. And it's hard because uh, the church is kind of new to figuring out how to have, a, and I'm using this, due process. And due process to the point that it doesn't become politicized, that it doesn't end up in the salacious press, um, and that it's done to the, uh, the benefit of, of uh, bringing back those who've been victims and uh, allowing for the repentance mm. uh, of those who have committed these hor uh, horatious crimes and uh, to let them uh, uh, certainly uh, be served by justice. It's hard. So hard that the uh, uh, 
uh, the Church of England is, well, they're not, it, within the shores of England, they have what's called the inquiry, the independent inquiry into child and sexual abuse. And that's been going on now uh, for a couple days. Uh, they've, uh, did I see, did they do an interview with the Archbishop of Canterbury? Or was that something else? Oh, no, that, no, that, that, that's coming later on. Okay. Um, uh, so, Kevin, you're right. It's, it's first of all, its its scope is going to lie outside the church mainly, mm -hmm. but it's decided to look at the diocese of Chichester as a case study. And I think we should say that, um, of course, there's child sexual abuse in the church, and they're looking at it and dealing with it. Uh, but there's much more outside the church. Mm -hmm. uh, we know we know two things. Um, one is that uh, some of our Lord's strongest teaching was reserved for people who. Uh, cause little the little ones to stumble so the highest standards are enjoined upon the church but we know too that human beings are are frail they're mm -hmm. fragile they make mistakes they're sinful and they fall and so we know the sexual abuse inside the church and and we should welcome the fact there's an inquiry to see uh, quite what happened but more importantly how the institution of the church itself failed to deal with the inquiry and i think one of the most heartrending things has been to hear some of the victims who are now grown men and women say look i, I went to ask for help uh the, the and 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 got absolutely nowhere now it wasn't just the, the church in the face of the church they got nowhere uh, they started with the police uh, and got nowhere in fact one one poor man who'd been um uh, civilly molested as a young boy by a vicar near eastbourne when he went to the police the police said so do you have children and do you bathe them? And he suddenly realized what they were doing was setting oh, no. him up as 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 a, a victim who would become a perpetrator, um, which was which was terrifying for him. So that now the, the good news is that the Church of England and other churches have learned as quickly as they're capable and are putting in procedures to deal with making themselves accountable. The bad news is it, it, it took them some time. Um, and this one of the things this inquiry is doing is looking at the Diocese of Chichester uh, as, as a case study. However, uh, as, I, as I listened to the uh, line of inquiry, I, I found myself getting very alarmed because uh, it seemed to me that the dots that the panel were joining up were, were producing the wrong shape, a shape that was untrue. So um, the previous Bishop of Chichester, John Hind, uh, said that one of the things that he had learned was that abuse happened in clusters and that one should look for collusion. And I think that was wise and, and quite right. And in the Diocese of Chichester, there was some <clears throat> uh, clergy, homosexual, paedophile abuse in one end of the diocese and some lay homosexual, paedophile abuse at the cathedral end, the west end of the diocese, both of which were terrible. But the questioning from the panel itself began to ask began to make a link between the diocese's traditional Anglo-Catholic reserve about women priests and the abuse itself, as if one led to the other. Now, there's no, there's no evidence whatsoever that holding a traditionalist view of priesthood uh, has anything to do with sexual abuse at all, uh, or, or, except for the fact that the elephant in the room in the Church of England is that the Anglo-Catholic movement has always had and still has a problem with homosexual practicing clergy in a way that forward in faith North America doesn't seem to have had at all. Uh, but to, to, to instead of facing this um, and describing the elephant in the room, uh, to, to, to link it instead to uh, implicit misogyny, um, well, first of all, is a, is, a, is a great category error. One of the things John Hines said again was he knew a number of people who were powerfully in favor of women priests who were quite as rude to women in practice as anybody he'd ever seen. And so, you know, the, the, the link they were looking for simply isn't there in the way they assumed to find it. But it, again, it was, it was a piece of political correctness, a piece of contemporary political prejudice that was being overlaid on the experience of the church, which I thought was a real tragedy because it'll take them up blind alley. Okay, they've been going on now for a little over a week. Has anybody, and I know you've been watching the testimony and all the video feeds on behalf of Anglican Inc. and Anglican mm -hmm. we thank you for that. Uh, it, it's hard to watch. Has anybody ever decided to verbally link homosexuality, pedophilia, and the cluster of abuse that you know just continues to 
to loop itself uh, in these types of things. Uh, so much so that even Hollywood is starting to make uh, these uh, gay films that include uh, the predatory part of uh, um, pr promiscuity and uh, prom oh, I can't even pronounce things today. Sorry, promiscuity. And I, I was interested if that topic ever came up. I, it's very politically incorrect, but statistically it exists. Well, I think the link between homosexual activity and pedophilia is a is a is a is a really problematic one. But as you say, it's absolutely off the agenda. Um, and the, the difficulty with with public inquiries is if that they're if they're driven by ideology rather than by fact finding, then then they they won't come to the right conclusions. So. Um, this is the beginning of the inquiry, and I, I, I you know, I'm, actually, I, I could even write in and make the point myself. So perhaps I should. Um, but but the the good news is that it, it will it will look at the Church of England to begin with, but it will then move its its scope out into secular society, uh, and certainly again one of the things you can't say in English society at the moment is that the greatest level of sexual abuse for underage girls is conducted by gangs of Muslim men. Right. And still to this day, still to, to this day, <laughs> this day, the newspapers will not describe them as Muslim men. And um, so here we have we have two pieces of, of, of secular ideology, which make it much more difficult to tell the truth and much more difficult to put in place uh, mechanisms that will will deal with the abuse and and defend victims. In the Roman Catholic Church, the vast majority of victims were young males. Uh, is that what you're finding in the Church of England? Uh, Kevin, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. I, I I do know that in the Diocese of Chichester, um, that I think that was true. Mm -hmm. uh, and and if, if, I, if I'm wrong, then I hope people will uh, will point out that I'm wrong and let me know. Uh, of course, both girls and boys were abused. Of course they were. Mm -hmm. But certainly the, the clusters that I knew about and that have come to light in the reports uh, in the last 10 years seem to me to be largely gay and, and pedophile. You also worked within the Diocese of Chichester, Chichester sorry, once again, coffee, not working yet. Uh, you've certainly heard rumors. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, don't tell me the rumors, but tell me your role within the diocese. Well, this actually um, brings up one of the things that they're struggling with at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, what happens is pe people come and make informal confessions. I mean, if they make formal confessions, that's another matter. I wasn't employed by the diocese. I was working, uh, employed by a university that was in the diocese, and so I had a, a permission to officiate. Mm -hmm. um, and I was astonished to hear about uh, rings of gay clergy amongst whom uh, licentious sexual activity was taking place. And... Uh, and, and, and of course, names were mentioned. It wasn't mentioned that the, the paedophile activity took place. I never heard it was paedophilia. That came out later on. Um, and, and the difficulty is for Christians, and the, the inquiry began to deal with this, is there's a very delicate balance between pastoral care of the people who either know about it or, or, or are drawn into the collusion or who are practicing it and... Um, uh, and the and the sin itself, and I think there's no doubt at all that that in the diocese of Chichester, the balance fell too far the side of exercising pastoral sensitivity to people who were caught up in the very least in the collusion, uh, and I think that's outraged some secularists. On the other hand, um, the whole issue of of confession and repentance and pastoral care. Uh, does get set alongside bad behavior. And, 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 and I mean, interestingly enough, I think one of the underlying things behind this is the same thing that, that ruined the relationship between Henry II and Beckett. I don't mean to be flippant. But, no, I but, think you're uh, right. It, 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 it was a, the question is, to what extent does the church allow secular agencies to act as its safeguard? To what extent does the church police its own? Uh, and if it fails to police its own, require secular outside help. Well, one of the interesting things is that certainly in the time I was there, the church policed its own and it did it very badly. And so now what's going to happen is um, there will be secular agencies policing the church. Well, that in itself is going to bring in other kinds of problems. So so you, one should say, well, OK, we shouldn't have failed to police ourselves in the first place. And that's true. But um, the, the, the solution 
the medicine may 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 not be as bad as the disease, may be, but it may be a problem in itself as well. Well, that's one of the bigger problems I see is um, top down, uh, there are accountability issues. Um, who are the bishops accountable to? It's very interesting you should say that, Kevin. Um, if I can be personal for a moment, sure. uh, one one of the posts I failed to be appointed to. <laughs> after what? Being, uh, one of the very many posts I failed to be appointed to after being uh, invited to present myself for an interview uh, was uh, being responsible for the training of the bishops in the Church of England. Um, and there were a number of uh, exciting moments of tension between me and my interviewers, uh, one of which is terribly funny. Um, but the one that wasn't funny was when I saw the jaws drop, when I said, this is how I would bring in a level of accountability to the bishops, which doesn't yet exist. And um, there were plenty of very good reasons for not appointing me to that post. Uh, but I suspect that that my notion of introducing accountability to the House of Bishops was was very alarming at that time. Now, the reason why that matters is not to pat myself on the back because I think anyone can see that. Uh, but but that just today, um, in the last couple of days, Adrian Hilton um, on the Cranmer blog uh, has has publicized the complaints uh, to do with a priest who is abusing boys and who then committed suicide um, and uh, holding the Archbishop of York accountable for doing nothing and allowing the situation to deteriorate to the point where, first of all, the priest was not brought to justice and secondly, where in, instead he killed himself. Um, now, Cranmer said, uh, the Archbishop of York has blood on his hands. It's a very, very strong thing to say. And I well, don't he, know he that I He backs it up with documentation that uh, has been leaked to him. Uh, where the Archbishop of York was, you know, obviously see these emails and just passed, you know, allegedly passed them on and didn't do anything. And did nothing. Uh, we don't know the whole story here, but that's interesting because who does York answer to? Uh, who well, do, at the end absolutely. of the day, does the Archbishop of <clears throat> York answer to anybody? Well, I think one of the reasons why um, Anglican Inc. is so important and why Cranmer's blog is so important and other political commentators is because the bishops in the Church of England, the archbishops, are not accountable. Uh, and they haven't, and part of the failure of due process. Uh, I, again, when, when I was in Jersey, there was an attempt to hold the Bishop of Winchester accountable for mm -hmm. what I appeared to us to be the, mo the most lamentable behavior. Mm -hmm. Three CDMs were brought against him, one of them by an official in the Royal Court, the Royal Ecclesiastical Court. Now, the, 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 only in Jersey, I think, and perhaps in the Isle of Man, does, does something like the Royal Ecclesiastical Court exist. Yes. <laughs> but, the but, but the official there brought the complaint against the Bishop of Winchester only to have it dismissed on the grounds he had no locus standi. He, he had wow. no, of, <laughs> of all the people in the whole world who have locker standing. Well, you can see what I'm saying. Sure. So the, we, have, we have a very real problem, and that is that um, uh, in those circumstances where bishops fall down on the job, they haven't been accountable, and, and they need to be. And I, I hope that that's one of the things will be addressed. However, I'm still very aware that... Um, uh, that this Henry II Beckett dilemma of of bringing in secular agencies to oversee the church and to hold it accountable for state values uh, that that's going to be really quite problematic to people with a with a high ecclesiology. Yeah, I I hope so. Um, I now we told you it's a tough topic. Uh, it's a tough topic because once again in the press in. Uh, England, I'm seeing Laura Carey's name come up, and uh, there was a uh, a letter people wanted to sign, and uh, I didn't see your name on it, but the letter basically said, "Stop attacking," and I'm summarizing <clears throat> Laura Carey because he's a conservative, and this is a conspiracy. Now I've met Laura Carey, delightful man, but I think he believes in due process. I think in the end of the day, he would want due process to be vindicated. And I, I don't think he, he's in favor of all this conspiracy talk. I don't know. He might be. Um, but let's talk about um, how Lord Carey is being re-brought into this. Well, there are a number of issues. First of all, before I forget, can I just say thank you for teaching me a new word, which I love, and Horatius. 
It's use it use it at the beginning of the <laughs> Horatius. It's a marvelous word, and I'm going to use it from now no, on. It's all yours. Uh, <laughs> it is, in fact, utterly Horatius, the way in which Carey uh, has been treated in the press. What's happened is, uh, I expect people know, because we've dealt with in the past, that Lord Carey was the Archbishop when Peter Ball was Bishop of Lewis and Gloucester, and uh, Lord Carey appears to uh, have been slow to uh, restrict his uh, continuing ministry as a retired bishop. And he's accused of having had enough information to have been to have made him very suspicious. Well, we've yet to discover quite how much information he has, and due process will bring that out. Um, the, the, what we can't do is either support him or attack him on that issue without right. the fact. That, however, he suffered in two ways, and they're both horatious. Uh, one is that the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, required him to step down from his role as an honorary bishop in order to, to penalise him for what Welby thinks was his mistake in <clears throat> in not acting swiftly enough. And one of the, there are two problems with that is one is uh, it's way out of time. Uh, how is it that, that when when you bring complaints against bishops, they they, they are only allowed they're out of time after a year, but. Um, uh, but 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 over George Bell and over Carey, there is no there is no statute of limitations. The other problem is that um, in this last week, somebody leaked to a newspaper the the, uh, the the information that the Crown Prosecution Service, the CPS, were preparing a criminal charge against Lord Carey for collusion. Um, now this is this is so unlikely as to be almost impossible. There are a number of reasons for that, uh, including the way in which the police have acted over Sir Edward Heath uh, and, and the problems of the, that Lord Carlisle brought into the public domain over George Bell. Um, and however, um, so first of all, this is almost certainly a piece of fake news. But the question is, why did two very reputable newspapers run this piece of fake, piece of fake news associating Lord Carey with collusion and sexual abuse? Uh, and, and at that level, I think there is a conspiracy. Now, uh, some people I've spoken to think that, this peop that the liberal establishment is still crossed with Lord Carey because of uh, Lambeth resolution that... that, that uh, called homosexuality sin. I've heard other people say that, that this may very well be a dirty tricks campaign that starts in Lambeth, because one of the things that Welby might be doing is to denounce people so that he doesn't get denounced. That the, It's the old communist thing. The, the, the <laughs> more people you point the finger at, the fewer that aren't pointing the finger at you. And the problem with that Welby is now facing is that we know from <clears throat> the lead bishop on safeguarding, Bishop Peter Hancock, that in the next couple of years there's going to be explosion of allegations of sexual abuse in the Church of England, uh, some of which will uh, will lap on to, to Welby's watch. However, whatever the reasons are, it is outrageous that George Carey should have a headline like this placed in the in the in the secular press, uh, and it is outrageous he should be judged without evidence. And to that extent. Uh, people should stand with him. I was asked to sign the letter and I refused because I thought the letter had, had chosen the wrong target and made the wrong complaint. But there is a target and there is a complaint, and uh, as I hope I've, I've, I've shown. Well, that, and that's the big question now. How do we have due process within the church? In the past, due process was always done behind closed doors kind of like how the uh, Church of England now conducts baptism, so we won't go there. But due process has been done uh, behind <clears> closed <throat> doors within the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, uh, all Everything was done. Uh, nod, nod, wink, wink. Yeah, we took care of that. He's We, we moved him out. He's a monk now, you know. Uh, he's serving in some, you know, seminary somewhere. And that didn't work. That caused further decay within the church a, a brighter red stain within the church how do we have due process that's more you know transparent to uh, the public uh, that allows us to uh, handle this in a way that is godly redemptive and uh, helps restore the victim Kevin, this is very, this is very difficult. Uh, just just I think today or yesterday, one of the priests who, as a young boy or a young young uh, adolescent, was uh, abused by Peter Ball, said, 
um, I have I have forgiven Peter Ball for the harm he ever did me, and I forgive him from my heart. But whatever abuse I experienced from Peter Ball, it was nothing compared to the abuse I've experienced from the child protection team of the Church of England of late. Uh, and another Cranmer put on a, a public appeal uh, not for, for for money because some poor uh, some poor more recent victim. Um, was refused travelling expenses because he bought the wrong train ticket, despite having you know no resources whatsoever. And so Cranmer then paid him his travelling expenses. Okay. I, I wrote in and said, "Can we crowdfund this?" And Cranmer yeah. said, "No, no. We just this was just a matter of 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 of, of humanity towards one person who's suffering." I think one of the things that 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 we have to learn in in our society is uh, you can't overcome sin by by just by due process or by administrative uh, overload. Overload's the wrong word. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, 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 an article was written recently, I think by, by uh, Jules Gomez wrote a very good article saying the bishops needed to be accountable. That was part of the problem. And I think a, a, a Catholic priest, American called Dwight Lonica, yeah. wrote another one picking that up saying that the only answer to, to this kind of sin is in fact for for clergy and Christians to treat themselves as high wire artists who uh, need to take great care lest we fall because to fall from where we are to fall from grace is a dangerous and terrible thing. In other words, within within the faith itself, we have all the resources: uh, confession, repentance, forgiveness, penance, restitution, accountability. All of those are, are part of the natural resources of the gospel and the Christian faith. Essentially, what we have to do is to be better Christians, uh, as well as making sure that our processes don't fail us. But the solution comes won't come through the process itself. We have to make sure they're not broken. The solution, I think, comes from from the gospel, from from living as Christians better than we've managed to do so far. All right, that's enough of our tough topics. Hopefully, our next recording will be a little more humorous, but we got to talk about this. It's a stain in the church. Mm. Gavin, I want to thank you for your time. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 377 of Anglican Unscripted.